I guess shifting a little to just Christian faith, basic Christian faith. Those were, I think, a lot of the, or even beliefs. I guess they kind of go hand in hand, but um, maybe more about um, higher power and how Christians view higher power. So higher power, um, when I hear the phrase, uh, to me refers to a perspective where we are here in our human existence And yet we acknowledge that our understanding of the world is not comprehensive. So if that is the case, and that's actually a fairly, that's not a very uh, drastic or radical concept. (laughs) If you think about it, you know, we all make decisions every day based on imperfect knowledge. I do not know what tomorrow's weather is going to be. I probably don't know in a couple hours what it's going to be. So I will routinely choose the wrong clothes or forget my umbrella. Um, We drive our cars on the streets, trusting that others are going to abide by roughly the same laws, but we often make mistakes. We sometimes break those laws ourselves because we're in a hurry and we assume it's okay to do that. A higher power then reminds us that in the midst of our finitude, in the midst of our limitations, we are part of a larger life reality that is not limited in the same way so that there is an experience of space that goes beyond what we can see and yet the same laws apply the same gravity the same gravitational fields the same magnetic fields and radiation fields to the ends of the universe there's the same experience of time we experience our own life and we talk about where we are in our in our life cycle and yet there's a whole other experience of time around us goes before us, goes in front of us. So the language around higher power is that humbling admission that we are not the center of the universe, nor are we the center of time. And once we take that in and and take it to heart, then we ask ourselves, all right, if there is more than me, if there is a reality beyond me, do I trust that reality or not? If we believe that reality has no face, has no intention, has no connection to us, but is simply a blank canvas, then it's, it is possible to function, to say, all right, I have this one life and I'll do the best I can in it, but that it has no meaning beyond that. Or we can choose to say that higher power, that larger reality has an intentionality to it. It moves in an arc towards what is just. It moves towards what is sustainable. I can either work with it or against it. Uh, So many of the uh, Chinese and Japanese uh, Eastern religions talked about the Tao, the the flow of life that's like a river and you either swim against it or you learn to swim and move with it. So a Christian faith would humbly recognize we are not the definer of reality. We participate in a larger reality, but that reality is ultimately good and loving. And our life's path is to open ourselves to that loving direction, to work with it to accomplish that which is just, to be patient knowing that we may plant seeds for trees we will never see take uh, full root and bear fruit, And yet we are part of a larger, promised, loving reality that extends beyond us. More than that, to try and define higher powers more than that is to step out of our comfort zone and our knowledge. So we can humbly say, I believe in God, and I believe in God as God has chosen to reveal God's self to me through scripture, through church, through my own prayer life and leave it at that, or we can try and ask other questions as a philosophical exercise, but we have to then be willing to remind ourselves, we may not know all the answers. And that's why dialogues that you're fostering are so important, because it's basically asking people to step back from assuming they already know the answer, whether that answer is life has no meaning or life has this narrow meaning, and to say, no, let me be surprised and see something beyond 
what I've already seen so far in my life, that I might grow further and learn more. Yeah, that's my, that's been my experience. I um, I grew up as you, I mean, as I said to you, I grew up in a Jewish home, went to an Episcopalian middle school and high school, and then I went to college and I met many people from all, all different walks of life and my, and continued religious study because I enjoy it and. I guess as you get into the deeper philosophical understanding of everything, you realize that a lot of the stories are similar. Everybody's interwoven that all these religions and cultures grew out of one another and diversity of thought and ideas and all of those things. So that, that, that is the goal to bring that all to, to people. Going off a little bit of what you were saying, the, I guess the, the Christian idea of God, who who is God and what does God do? I know you, you talked about a lot of love and kindness and, and grace of God, but what, I guess, what, how does God communicate with people or how, how does God want, I guess, people to live their lives in that way? All right. So there are, there are, have been two main paths people have used to try and talk about God. Uh, what's, one's called a via negativa, which simply says, in my life I've seen power, but God is not like human power, like an army. God is not like human um, aggression, or God is not like even human wealth. The other way is via positiva, which says, I've seen love. I've known love for my family or for my partner. And God is the highest expression of that love. I've seen compassion and kindness shown to me, and God is the highest level of kindness and compassion. There is value in both of those, and you can read scores of books that have explored those pathways. But the problem is, once you move to the extremes, either God is absolutely not like this to the nth degree, or God is totally like this to the nth degree, you stop saying anything concrete. So the Christian response to that has often said, let us use that language. Let's use poetry. Let's use art. Let's try as best we can through our aesthetic senses, through our emotional senses, through our creative senses to talk about God. But if we're going to really try and hone in on an image, let us be bold enough to hone in on the image of a person. So the image of Jesus is put forth as a distillation of those various qualities. Knowing that that is, by choosing one expression, it's saying no to other expressions. But also knowing that if you can start with one expression, now you have a place to go deeper, to challenge, to be inspired by, um, to be filled with wonder. Um, Da Vinci picked, you know, the Mona Lisa for whatever reason and picked that pose and that smile. And it's maybe not his best picture, but it's one that we now can identify certain traits with. And it becomes this touchstone for other explorations. In the same way, the Gospels talk about Jesus, and they may not give us all the information we want, but they give us a starting point. And out of that, then, we begin to ask questions when Jesus did this, what does that mean in my own life? When Jesus said this, how do I understand that in 2020 today? Um, when Jesus talked about this tradition of Moses and the prophets, how would I talk about those same themes of justice today? Um, when Jesus talked about obedience and humility, what does that look like for me today? So to your question, it is in that dialogue between a concrete expression, a scripture, a belief, a story, when we start to live into it and let it um, interrogate us, let it challenge us, let it sometimes comfort us, and in that moment, we're in a place where we could hear a response, a response that maybe says through a similar word of scripture, I am with you always, even to the end of the age from the end of Matthew, a scripture that says, blessed are the poor for of such is the kingdom of God that speaks to our economic reality. So 
God speaks, God engages in our willingness to ask questions of God and to quiet ourselves enough to allow answers to be brought forth to us. That's different from the handwriting on the wall, the, the voice crying into the ear telling you to do something. Um, it's less about visions and being uh, taken control of by something that's outside of you, and rather it's the letting go and allowing that voice and that dialogue to guide you and to sense it from within. And you mentioned, you mentioned a little about God and Jesus. And just for our listeners who may not know, can, can you talk about the relationship with God, of, of God and Jesus and how they're connected? Sure. So the relationship between God and Jesus was not an easy one to put into words and categories. In fact, it took the early Christian church almost 300 years to even begin to get a couple sentences that came close to describing it. But to use human relational categories, when you are fully connected to another person, let's say a child to a mother, you can anticipate their moods. You can seek to do what you, as best you can to please them because you love them and that brings you joy. And you trust them you trust that they are with you so that even when you're afraid or stumbling or going the wrong direction, you know that they are there and will correct and guide you. So that is a fundamental relationship. And that's the starting point that Jesus possessed that fundamental relationship with God that was seen by his followers. And that was part of how he self described his own relationship. Now you go beyond that. If the actions that, a person does guide you and, and flesh out a larger ethic, a larger love, then those, those actions are more than just symbols. They are actually a fleshing out of a deeper reality. So Jesus not only had that close relationship with God, but Jesus' words and actions incarnated is the term we use made flesh, made tangible a reality that is bigger than any one life, a reality of love and justice and righteousness. And then thirdly, that relationship and that incarnating of a deeper truth was something that was stronger than the bounds of one human life. So that even though death came as a reality when Jesus was crucified, the story, the relationship, and that incarnational model didn't end there, but moved beyond it. And so the Christian language will say that Jesus' relationship with God involved the fullness of God and who Jesus was, intentionality and action, the clearest interpretation and expression of God through his actions, and a reality of God that goes beyond death itself. Now, that was where the early church ended. And as the church tried to find more language for it, they would go one more step further and say that all of those together meant that Jesus' being and God's being were connected, were together in a oneness. And that oneness was relational. So the connection they use is the language that we call the Trinity. There's God seen as a creator. There is Christ Jesus as the expression, the fullest expression of that creation. And then the spirit is the combining of those two in a mutual union. Uh, a better way to think of it is uh, the reality of a lover and the beloved and the love that exists between them. They are three distinct realities and yet they are basically one and the same. And it is that language that Christians have often used to speak about Jesus' relation with God. 